Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, continuing our, our virtual college tour on Executive Suite <laughs> with the presidents of our various universities in southern New England. We are very pleased to be joined this week by the Chancellor of Johnson & Wales University, John Bowen. John, thanks for being here. Thank you, Ted, for inviting me here. Absolutely. Here. So, um, everyone knows it's easy with colleges. I bring on companies, sometimes people haven't heard of them, but everyone knows what Johnson & Whale is, but they might not know the scale of the enterprise. So how many students do you have? What is, what's Johnson & Wales by the numbers? Johnson & Wales was founded by two women, Miss Johnson and Miss Wales, long before their time, uh, before they could even vote. Here they are starting a university. And a century ago, right? A century We're right ago. At we just finished our centennial last year. And they started out with uh, two students and one typewriter on Hope Street. And lo and behold, fast forward today, here we are, we're 16,000 students strong. Uh, we have four locations here in Providence, Rhode Island. We also have a campus in Charlotte, North Carolina, Denver, Colorado, and North Miami, Florida. And that's actually the reason you are chancellor, because uh, people think of, say, like the UMass, yes. there's a chancellor because there's multiple campuses, and it's the same for you, right? Correct. When you have a system like that, uh, we decided, and the Board of Trustees approved it, to have presidents at each one of our campuses, and then the chancellor would be the CEO and head of the whole system. Now, when you say Johnson & Wales to people in Rhode Island, they think, cooking, yes. think of food, and yes. you don't mind that, of course, because it's a great reputation, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in Johnson & Wales. What's one of the biggest things you think people in Rhode Island don't know about Johnson & Wales? Well, there's two things. Let's stay with food. We're so famous for it. We're world famous. We're a great, great program. We're a world leader in it. But we're actually transitioning in food to really get into wellness, sustainability, health and nutrition, and all the health sciences as well. Uh, sustainability, where are the fish coming from? What kind of fish are we taking out? Are they sustainable? So we're really looking at minors in culinary arts as well, so students can go ahead and focus on that. So culinary, we're still evolving. Uh, good food, but now let's go deeper. In addition to that, we have a great program in business. We've got great accounting, business administration programs, a great MBA program as well, uh, technology programs. Uh, arts and science programs now. We've just launched a new biology program. So we're on the move. It's a transformative years of J&W happening right now. Now, I'm interested um, with the culinary evolution and what you're talking about there. Is that driven, is that the school pushing it on to the students, or is that bubbling up from the students wanting to know that? You know what? I, I just look at this intersection. It's what's happening in our society right now. Uh, people are demanding it. Farm to table is so big. Right here, we've got a strong, strong effort in this state. We're hearing it from there. We're hearing it from the employers of restaurants. Customers are demanding it. Uh, fishermen are demanding it. Um, we're actually working with fishermen that are coming in and saying, look, this, this population is kind of fished out. Here's something else that people don't know. Can you take play with this and develop some new recipes for this? And that's what we're going ahead and we're doing as well. So it's really coming all sides. So 100 years old, Johnson Wills, yes. 101, I guess mm -hmm. now. Uh, yes. You haven't been there the whole time. Wouldn't nope. date you that much. But <laughs> a good amount of it, four decades now you've been at Johnson Wills. 41 years. 41 yeah. years, impressive. Um, there's been an interesting shift. There have been a lot of shifts over that time. But especially in the last decade since you took over, you're on mm -hmm. your second strategic plan. And, and the shift, it, it looks to me as an outsider reading through the documents, sort of a, a shift from a lot of focus on growth to a lot of focus on quality. How Yes. Would, how would you describe the, what's been going on? That's exactly, I remember looking at a report and we were recruiting a lot of great students coming in here and they really were totally matched up and they, they were not graduating. And I was troubled by that. And I said, let's see if we can be more selective. And we started getting more selective. Why else are we losing students? And we found out financially that students were coming in and they really couldn't afford to graduate, to stay all the way through. So we decided we're going to take fewer in and actually double the amounts of financial aid. Um, so over the last six years, we've really taken it from, four, from just over $70 million to just over $140 million in institutional scholarships. And that's what the institution does. That's before federal or state or other independent scholarships fall into it. And that's really made a big, big difference. And has that helped you with retention? It has. Retention efforts to move that needle one percentage point in higher education is mammoth. We've actually moved it 10 percentage points. And that's the number of students who stay through and then are able to get a degree? Correct. Yeah. Um, you, you also, uh, you talked about in there that the selectivity numbers you went for in the first strategic plan, the new one says it didn't quite get to where you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, why was that and what lessons did you take from it for the future? Well, when you start 
um, increasing the requirements that are there. We, we used to fish in a big pond right over here um, with very few other fishermen there. And now all of a sudden, here we are, we're competing in a different, higher competition. Um, many private institutions are looking for the exact same students that we're looking for. Thus, we have to give out greater and greater financial aid. And it's not only need-based, it's also merit-based as well. And uh, we've been able to do that um, by holding down tuition. Uh, we're holding it right down around inflationary uh, uh, numbers. We're also increased fundraising efforts. Um, and we went through line by line on the individual budgets and said, what can we cut out and reallocate into scholarships. And the other thing that we've done in that regard um, that I'm very, very proud of in this whole thing, before a student can actually enroll here, the students and the parents need to take a financial literacy program that we've developed. We actually bought some software and, and um, customized it to ourselves. Yeah, because an 18-year-old doesn't actually understand the scale of a $150,000 investment in education or whatnot. That's right, and about a third of our students, if not more, are first-generation college um, graduates are coming into us. So the parents don't necessarily have that sophistication either. But it's really an investment in their, in their lives. And so they have to go through this financial literacy program so that they understand what the payments will be once they graduate. And that's really helping students select who comes and who doesn't. Now, when I think about the kind of thing that might keep a college president up at night, I mm -hmm. think of demographics and the fact that we're seeing fewer, just because of the baby boom and then their children, and exactly. now where we are, we're seeing fewer millennials, fewer people coming out of high school for you to, to try to convince to come to Johnson & Wales. How big a challenge is that? It is. It, 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 it's a huge challenge. There's no doubt about it. In particular, up here in the Northeast, it's even worse. Um, so you just look at it, and again, uh, when I went to the Board of Trustees and announced this program, said that we're going to right-size this, or as the demographics are going down like that, enrollment, too, will end up going down. But if we can accept fewer students but keep them longer through graduation, we'll, we will also have a great business model going forward, and we're transforming lives going there. People enrolling will end up graduating and really going on to successful careers. I was struck you talk about financial aid, the cost of college, always a big topic. Uh, there was a Boston Globe story last week, reference to Johnson & Wales graduate, a chef, very good chef, sounds like, in demand, had $120,000 in mm -hmm. debt. Uh, not sure if that's all from Johnson & Wales or not. I didn't say in the story, but yeah. is that getting common for students to get over six figures, and I, does it concern you? I mean, it's very <laughs> concerning, obviously. Um, th that's a pretty, pretty high end um, going into it. Are there cases like that? I'm sure that there are. Um, but, you know, once you get into the average debt, the medium average debt is about thirty to $33,000. And is, it, is there much we can do about it? Or is it just this is going to be the cost of college going forward? Well, um, yes, there's many things we can go ahead and do about it. First of all, hold down the cost of tuition to, again, inflationary if you can. Cut out things that aren't necessary. You know, there's almost an arms war going on in higher education. You have to have the best resident facilities. You have to have the best gymnasium. You have to have a rock climbing wall. You have to have all these things. You need a chalkboard in the classroom. Um, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but really, let's get back to the basics, what we really and truly need, and let's concentrate on that. Hold down the cost as much as you can. Um, businesses now are stepping forward um, because of the labor shortage, and they're recruiting our graduates, and they're saying they'll also give them bonuses up front that would go towards their college debt, and I think that's we're doing more and more partnering with industry. The fabled rock climbing wall. You always hear that when you're talking about the arms raising yep. in college. All right, we're yep. going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk much more with Johnson & Wales Chancellor John Bowen about some of the exciting new projects happening on his various campuses. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we're talking today, I call it our virtual college tour here in the studio, and this week we have the Chancellor of Johnson & Wales University, John Bowen. He's the head of all four Johnson & Wales campuses around the country. They're not just in Providence, though. I do think that's more than half the students overall, right? Yes, yes. So, John, we were talking off air. We've been talking about financial aid before that, and you, you told me an interesting statistic about, about student debt at Johnson & Wales and the trends you've seen. What is that? Once we doubled the amount of institutional students aid that we're giving our students, um, we put it on a trend line to see what was happening. And we found out that actually our student debt obviously was going down, 
But at the same time, what was happening is the national student debt was going up. So it was an inverse. So you're able to get the trend in, which I'm sure Absolutely. you're happy and about. We got to jump on this before it really became, this is going back, you know, um, seven years that we start, we've yeah. been on this journey doing this. Now, uh, on the more positive side of things, especially, uh, I was thinking as I prepared for the show, in a way, Johnson Wales model seems like it was ahead of its time. You've always been focused on careers, we're getting ready for a job, it's a job, you know, of course you respected learning for learning's sake, but there was always yeah. a career focus there. Now you see all the colleges and universities focusing on that. Is that an advantage for you? I, I believe so. Um, right, again, back to Miss Johnson and Miss Wales. When they founded the university, they said, we're not going to teach for education sake. We're going to be teaching for practicality and so they can go to work and that that's in our DNA but at the same time we realized decades ago that we also have to have a proper balance here with the arts and sciences and the humanities because it's not enough just to have the job skills you have to have the communication and the analytical skills as well to go along with it so you, you got to have that balance and as part of that you've launched I know a number of new academic programs uh, in the decade or so you've been at the helm which uh, what are some of the more interesting ones or surprising well, I think ones? the brand new one uh, brand new we're in our, we just accepted our second class we're accepting applications now for the third class a physician assistant program and I think that's a natural outgrowth of the university um, particularly because of what we've been doing in food um, we're teaching nutrition to the chefs now. Before, we just teach them how to cook and how to put all the fats and the salts and all the things that were tasty in there. And then we recognized that's not good. Um, we need to go ahead and teach other things as well. So we went into nutrition. And then uh, we partnered with Tulane University, where uh, folks studying medicine will actually take the exact same nutrition course that our chefs are taking. And now I'm proud to talk about our partnership with Brown University, the Warren Alpert School of Medicine, uh, the exact same thing is happening there. Our culinary students are actually teaching uh, their students uh, in pre-medicine um, nutrition. And it's so important because I think as we're moving down in this journey of health and wellness, instead of just writing a prescription and pop a pill, let's go back and say, is there such a thing that you can do with your diet, with exercise? Is there a thing that we can do to be able to go ahead and fortify the foods? Is there a thing that we can do in food medicine as well? So this intersection is happening between culinary arts, culinary science, health and sciences, and physician assistant uh, and medicine all coming together. So I'm very bullish and very excited about what's going to happen in the future. And that's why we're looking at more and more program in the health sciences. And as you look at the economy, where are you really getting the growth on everything is in health sciences right now. Um, and that's projected to grow at 30% per year, um, going out quite a ways. And as the aging population is <laughs> happening around here, um, it's a good thing. So th this is going to be exciting careers uh, that people will be coming to Johnson & Wales for. We're talking to Johnson & Wales Chancellor John Bowen. And uh, John, I wanted to ask you, too, we got to talk about physical expansion. People are always excited to see Absolutely. cranes in the air. <laughs> and uh, re one, another interesting thing about you guys, earlier this year, Johnson & Wales became the first organization to actually break ground on the old 195 land. We've yes. been talking about it for a million years, it feels like. But you're the ones actually building something. People uh, watching on TV can see the groundbreaking there. What are you building? And uh, how did you get to be first? Yeah, this, uh, this goes back. I've actually been working on this program almost 12 years. Uh, so it's been a long time in coming. And um, it's a three-story building, 71,000 square feet. It's an academic building. It'll be a robotics laboratory, uh, school of biology. We'll go ahead and be there. A brand new program for us that we're launching. The first class is coming in this September as well. And um, we're very proud to be able to get it coming out of the ground. The cranes are over there. It's three stories are up right now of the steel. And we're moving along. I, I think this is going to be a catalyst um, for other uh, folks to commit to Providence. This is our invitation. Uh, things are going well. The university is investing over $40 million in this project, um, so we're excited about it. It'll be walking distance to the uh, right across the street as our physician assistant program. Um, we're excited to be able to see that the School of Nursing, um, the partnership between Rick and URI and Brown, it's just going to be a wonderful place. Um, I was a little naive. I thought we could start construction sooner than this, but I did not realize the amount of infrastructure that needed to take place hooking up the utilities. I thought because we already had a building next to it, we'd be able to tap into that. But didn't work. Huh? I don't handle I don't handle a hammer at home either. So <laughs> um, I, I've learned quickly that that needed to take place. And um, I think that a lot of work has been done on that infrastructure. Uh, we're ready to go now. Um, the streets are in. The sidewalks are in. And at the same time, uh, I know there's some criticism out there. Perhaps they're not moving along as fast. 
but when I go ahead and I look at it, it's, I think it's better to do it right and to make sure that you get the right mix and the right size plots of land in there. Um, not only just what makes sense for the city scape, certainly you need that, but also to invite the right businesses in there that will really fall into this community and blend in very well. Now, when do you think you'll have the building done? I know maybe it didn't start as soon as you wanted, but when do you think it'll be finished? Well, uh, Brad Demio uh, <laughs> has this project. He has given me a guarantee that this will be ready a year from now. Okay, so you feel good about that. I feel very good about it. <laughs> and um, On time and on budget, Brad, too, I might add. No, okay, so, no, okay. please watch. You heard that, uh, Brad. We'll have you on if it doesn't happen. Um, could you see Johnson Wells using any more of the 195 land? Or I know you've always been cautious with money. Yeah, uh, we, we may. We may. I'm waiting to see what private industry or government will go ahead and uh, take up. We need some more housing. There's no question about that. Um, I want to make a requirement um, for additional housing. Right now, it's really just for freshman students um, to live on campus. We'd like to explore that because that also helps in retaining students through graduation as well. Um, my preference is, um, really, I'm open. I can't really say that I do ever. I'm open. Uh, we can do it. Uh, we do own, own land in other parts of the city and down at our Harborside campus so we can build there. But I'm also uh, excited to see the Phoenix Corporation. They're coming in. Uh, That's got a, a project group out of Texas doing of student housing on Student housing, and that would be a, a mix of many colleges and universities going ahead and sharing. I think that would be an interesting experiment as well. So we're open to that. All right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Johnson & Wales Chancellor John Bowen about the food economy and his school's role in that. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are talking with the Chancellor of Johnson & Wales University, John Bowen. John, uh, uh, we were talking about real estate before the break, the 195 land. Uh, another deal, uh, real estate deal recently, you guys did WPRO report earlier this year. You'd purchased the Port Edgewood Marina in Cranston. You're getting into the marina business? What's the plan? Not, not really. Um, we own, um, obviously, a lot down in the Harborside campus, which many of the Rhode Islanders know as the shipyard. And we also only, as Rhode Islanders know, the uh, former Cranston Hilton Hotel, which is now a resident hall for us. And right in between it was the marina. And when that became available, I said, you know, that makes make sense for us because right now our students have to leave the resident hall and either walk or get in their car and drive around to get to the harbor side. Wouldn't it be neat if we could build a boardwalk and mm. they could just walk back and forth to classes and dining and sport, sporting events and things. And um, in addition, we have a sail club uh, and a team, and uh, I said, you know, this is going to really make some sense. We can clean up that area um, as well by doing this boardwalk and re-landscaping it, and so it worked out. And uh, Any sort of timeline on that project, which when you want to see We've already what? started on it right now. We've, um, we're in there, uh, and um, stay tuned. More will be happening in the fall, and a lot more will be happening in the springtime. Interesting. We'll keep an eye on that yes. then. Uh, a question off the beaten path for you. Would you ever consider opening a fifth campus? You guys are all over the country right now. Have you looked at that, or is it, do we, you like the footprint now? We have um, more by invitation than anything else. Um, I'm going to say um, probably 16 times a year I receive a telephone call or a letter either from a, um, a mayor or a governor or a private entity that is inviting us to take a look at it. Um, so far, I've been saying no and turning these offers down. We're really going through a transformation at Johnson & Wales, um, and I'm really bringing the whole university to a higher playing level and a higher quality, and we're looking at, I'd rather introduce new programs, and the edict that we have right now is three to five new programs of study each year over the next three to five years. And really looking at where are the jobs going to be in the future, the way we've always looked at it. But where are the higher paying jobs in the future? And let's go after that. And right now we're very, very bullish on health sciences. And you're going to see more and more of that. And as I talked earlier in the show, more minors in culinary arts. Because an interesting thing that's happening in culinary arts, 20 years ago, 80% of our graduates would go out and actually cook and become chefs and culinarians and 20% in food service related area. That's actually flip-flopped. Right now, only 20% are really going out and they really want to become chefs and cooks. And um, there's so many other opportunities available through health and nutrition, food styling, food photography, blogging, um, restaurant critics. Um, so you're really combining more of the arts and humanities and uh, 
communication courses with food service. And I want to stick with the food uh, question. We're talking with Johnson Wales Chancellor John Bowen. Um, Rhode Island as a state is pushing more the idea of the food economy. Restaurants, uh, uh, manufacturers like um, Daniele up in Burrowville yes. production, all that. Great job. To do. Um, yeah, they do. They've had yeah. them on. The wonderful guys. Yeah. At what sort of role is Johnson Wales? It's always mentioned. What sort of role do you see Johnson Wales playing in that effort? I, I think we're a leader, obviously, because we're turning out so many qualified graduates that can work in the food service industry. That's why the restaurant quality here I described 41 years ago when it came to Rhode Island that this was a gourmet desert. And today, when you go ahead and look at it, we're a leader. And we're not just saying it. I mean, national publications are saying it. Uh, many of our graduates are either the head chef or they own the restaurants here. So we're blessed with that. So looking down the road, I see more and more of this happening. And J&W needs to take a bigger leadership role. I, Last week I toured Hope in Maine, and I'm very excited about what I see happening over there. That's the food incubator in Warren, I believe. Yes, it is, and doing a wonderful job. Um, many of our faculty and our students are involved over there, and our graduates. Um, we need to do more. I've visited with uh, the governor. Um, she's very excited about this as well. I've pitched her an idea. She's challenged me to do some other homework on that, which we're working on right now as well. Um, but we're blessed to have so many people here and the farms and, and to be able to have the ports here that we have and to be able to go ahead and have the fishing that we have. We have everything coming together here. Why not become a food capital? Um, I was looking, the last time Moody's Investor Service, this is a business show obviously, they took a look at Johnson & Wales, they had high praise for uh, sort of, they, it seems, they seem to think a tradition of good financial management at Johnson & Wales and yes. frankly it seemed to be contrasting with maybe what they see when they review some other schools books. Yes. What, what is it about Johnson & Wales that you do kind of differently from other higher ed that's kept you in that position? It, it's a priority. Um, I, I don't have all the records going back to a hundred years but folklore each year, uh, we've been able to go ahead and balance our budget, and I'm not going to break that string right now. <laughs> We're going to continue to do that. It's a priority. Um, you know, we have to be responsible. We ask our students to be responsible. We have to be fiscally responsible as well. And so we've just made it a priority. We've got great people in our accounting and finance department, and we've got great administrators and managers of, of the budget and the purse strings, and they are held accountable to it. We do not go over budget. And about 30 seconds left. i got to make a pitch for people to visit the museum yes. you have at yes. your Harborside campus. Yes. I don't know how many people know this is there, and it's open to the public. Tell them quickly what this is and if they can go. It is. Th this is a tremendous culinary artifacts. We have everything. We've got a great collection, president to president collection, from the first president all the way up to Obama, a presidential artifact about culinary arts, whether it's a menu or a plate or um, a handwritten letter from Thomas Jefferson to somebody in Providence about the great pheasants that he got here and was looking for more. It's a great place to come and visit. All kinds of food, and kitchen new supplies. You can sort of go, walk through the years. There's of a how diner inside food. the building. Yes, it's, a, it's a really cool spot. So check that out, the Culinary Arts Museum. You can Google it. It's at the Johnson & Wales Harborside Campus. Chancellor John Bowen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ted. And really thank you for much. tuning thank in you. and listening to Executive Suite this week. Be sure to tune in next week and every week and join us again. You can also get us, as you know, as a podcast on iTunes or Sunday nights on 630 WPRO 99.7 FM. See you back here next week on Executive Suite.